uh, there's two main effects that I that I see when it comes to how the law impacts creativity right now. One is very clearly it changes the art that gets made. Uh, and the second is that it very clearly makes the artist poorer, not just the artist who, uh, who did the sampling maybe, but actually the whole pool of, of uh, artistic money and how that gets split up. A lot of it doesn't get back to the artist at that point. I'll get into that a little bit later. But I want to talk about how it changes things first. Um, there's there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a, something I call it the fair use precipice, which is this concept that if, uh, if you use something and you think it's fair use, if it is fair use, if you have to go to court and you find out that it is fair use, you don't have to pay anything anybody except, of course, the lawyers who defended you. Um, if it's not fair use, suddenly you're, you're there and you can get statutory damages against you, you could lose all your profits, you can, you know, there's very draconian remedies that could be invoked. But when you think about it from a, uh, and you step back for a second and think like, well, wait a second, you know, what we're talking about is, you know, if, if fair use is a, is a 5 out of 10 or something, we're talking about going to 5.1, 5.2, and that creates these draconian remedies uh, that can wipe people out. And that's, that's, it almost abrogates the concept of fair use because nobody would ever do that. Nobody, you know, no commercial interest is ever going to be out there going like, well, I think we can just skirt by on this one. Uh, like when, the, when Bismarcky got sued, uh, Warner Brothers had a, a uh, when, they, when they lost with the Thou Shalt Not Steal case, um, Warner Brothers after that, had this whole process of review by a, there was a board that would review like all the records to make sure that there was you know all the samples on there were cleared you couldn't do anything you couldn't even mix the record until all the samples were cleared um, so it really affected what happened you know in that company afterwards and really affected the industry as a whole what we see now a lot is that um, you know people like to to sample because it's a good thing what happens is it, it's fun for them. It's, it's a different way of doing things. It's, it's uh, you know, you can do it that way. You can do it a lot of other ways. You can make music any, any way you want. It's just one way to do it. And certainly when you're in the underground, they tend to use a lot of samples. And, you know, I mean, like the Grey album or something like that, where it's, where it's really, you know, uh, the clearances would be absolutely prohibitive. So what happens a lot is that it floats around on the underground, and then if it gets picked up by a major, they go through this process of clearing the record as much as they can, and removing the samples that uh, that they couldn't clear or that would be prohibitively expensive. Um, sometimes those records get out and get big first, and then you do the clearances afterwards. And uh, that happened, for instance, with the Fugees. They um, they released a wonderful record that uh, had a lot of uncleared samples, and there was you know litigation and 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 uh, you know settlements going on for years and years afterwards. So you see a lot of that from the, the transition from underground to mainstream and the uh, first record, second record kind of concept where, you know, the sampling just gets pushed under the, uh, under the rug and it doesn't really happen anymore. Um, it also limits sometimes not, not just uh, hip-hop, but uh, a great example is uh, Warren Haynes and Government Mule, Warren being a North Carolina guy. They do an amazing version uh, of the Who song, Young Man. But they only do it live because the way that, they, uh, that they've arranged it is that the entire song is arranged from Led, with Led Zeppelin uh, guitar parts. So it would be like, you know, some bits from In My Time of Dying or A Whole Lot of Love and all that kind of stuff, all sort of cut and pasted uh, to make a new version of Young Man, but the lyrics are still Young Man. And so uh, it's, you know, it's, it's nothing that they can ever record. It will never be recorded because... You can't go and get all those licenses from, uh, from the publishers who represent the Led Zeppelin catalog. It wouldn't really work out that way. Even if it did, it wouldn't be worth it because uh, Warren's a great songwriter. He's written the number one country hit ever, the, uh, the Garth Brooks song. Uh, he doesn't really need to do that stuff. This is just something he's doing to have fun, which leads me to the second concept that I want to talk about, about how the clearance process really makes the artistic community as a whole that much more poorer. When you think about it for a second, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the, the rationale and the justification for obtaining clearances is that, you know, is that it's felt that the original artist should get something, too. You know, if you sample James Brown, he should get something, which on its face, I think, is, is uh, you know, not a horrible position at all. It, it kind of makes some sense, uh, and, I, and I don't begrudge people for holding it. But what the reality is, is that it doesn't really work like that. 
I mean, I suspect that one of the reasons why James Brown isn't licensing stuff is because he's probably unrecouped at the record company. He doesn't get anything. So he's like, well, if I could get the money, it might be a different thing. It might be a different answer. But if I'm not going to get the money, then why should I? Uh, it's important to understand how the licensing income is split between an artist and a record company. Let's stick with James Brown just for, for the sake of, uh, of ease. If you want to license something that incorporates James Brown in it, you have to go to, um, what is it? He's on Universal or he, he was, his catalog has been bought by Universal. Um, when they license something, one of his masters for a use, the typical split is 50-50 between the artist and the record company. So if you pay, if artist A pays $100 to clear, um, to clear that sample, it's not that $100 goes to James Brown and now that, you know, he's paid the tithe and, and you know, somehow that's a zero-sum game and everything's been, everyone's been made whole. What actually happens is that $50 goes straight to Universal and $50 might get to James Brown if he's recouped, uh, but he usually isn't. Uh, for those of you who don't know the way record contracts work very well, uh, most of the costs incurred in making the record, well, all the costs incurred in making the record and most of the costs that are incurred in uh, marketing the record are typically recoupable solely from the artist's money, which the effect is is that they very rarely collect royalties for their, uh, for their records. It's, uh, they usually stay perpetually unrecouped especially with these catalog artists where, where you know, um, they haven't had, you know, big, big, big hits or uh, there's just, you know, the, the, um, the account stays on recoup for years and years and years. So what happens is that out of that $100, uh, you know, Universal definitely gets 50 of it and they probably get the second 50. And if that was it, that wouldn't be the end of the world. Well, I guess it would be the end of the world. But if that was it, it, it actually gets worse because now the the artist A still has to pay the clearance fees. They have to, I mean, not the clearance, the license fees, but the, the cost to get it cleared, whether it's their lawyer that's clearing it or whether there's a specialized sample clearance house uh, that's doing that. You know, that, that could cost thousands of dollars just itself, having someone deal with the, with the transaction. So what happens is out of that $100 uh, that, that was originally going to be in the artist A's pocket, chances are that maybe none of it is in any artist's pocket anymore, uh, plus the clearance fees, maybe call that another $15. So you have like now $115 has disappeared from the artist's compensation pool. And, uh, you know, it's really not compensating much of anybody.